think. Um, so just to Andy, give you I'm a sorry, quick update. Quick. Oh, I'm sorry. I just want to mm -hmm. let you know too that we are we're going to record this, so we can make sure to Great. be able to share it with um, folks that can't join us today. Fantastic. Uh, so I think that uh, obviously if you got the the email yesterday, that's how you know about the call. And so um, we're very lucky to have been able to work with our partners again at LNI and the DOSH team, the Occupational Safety and Health, as well as uh, our friends over at the Department of Health to get an updated phase two uh, protocol structure put in place. Um, and uh, you've likely been able to have the opportunity to, to hopefully be able to glance at that uh, and the links that were included in the governor's announcement yesterday. Uh, so we're gonna go through that. First, I wanted to let you know that essentially the protocols have been updated to be the same between phase one and phase two. Uh, so if you get past page one of uh, either one of those documents, you'll notice that from that point forward, the document stays pretty much in sync um, between the phases. So that was a, a huge uh, win, I think, for uh, simplifying how to administer this going forward. Uh, what you will notice though, is there is uh, a couple of differences there. So first in phase one, you'll notice that um, rather than saying all non-lecture base, it still uses the language of low risk, higher education and critical infrastructure workforce training. And it is still um, restricted to that list of approved programs that um, is also posted out on the governor's COVID-19 reopening website. Uh, so, what I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through the protocols under the context of phase one, just to make you aware, though, that that is there and that uh, if your campus or your site is in a phase one county, then those are the protocols that you need to uh, remain following. Uh, and um, as you transition in your areas to phase two, at that point, you'd be able to shift over to the phase two side of it. So we're going to dive in now over into the phase two document, and that's where we'll spend most of our time today. Uh, so the first thing again is this definition of all non-lecture based higher education uh, workforce training programs. Uh, so this was done in collaboration with our uh, friends at Workforce Board as well as DOL, since this will apply for their programs too. Uh, so forgot to probably mention that um, DOL is probably also on the line with us today. Um, so. I'm just going to kind of point out where some of the differences are, and then we can open it up for questions after that. Uh, so the first thing is that uh, we still remain in phase two, strongly encouraged to maintain anything that we can uh, in an online, remote, or virtual modality. That does not change. Um, one thing that you'll notice in the language that's different now in the document is that it no longer requires the posting of your COVID-19 plan, but whether that the plan must be available at each location. So I wanna note that, um, that text change uh, on the first page. Uh, down underneath your requirements as an employer on the first page, you'll notice that the first bullet underneath that uh, references the language that, um, or the statement rather that the employers and students, the employees and students should be educated or receive their training related to coronavirus in the uh, language that they best understand. And so that's a clarification that's been coming up uh, multiple times. And so that's clarified for us there uh, in that first bullet. Uh, there's a requirement there to provide PPE to employees uh, at no cost remains. And so just pointing that out for you. And then uh, what I think is an important reference here is about uh, the distinction between face coverings and masks and the different levels of those. And so the documentation provides a link out to, um, I believe it's LNI's website around coronavirus facial coverings and mask requirements to help you assess the risk level and uh, what the appropriate PPE would be uh, given the different scenarios on our campuses and our training locations. Uh, so those are there as well as a link over to uh, Department of Health uh, guidance relative to, clay, to cloth face coverings. Uh, later in the document, you'll see that there are some pretty um, uh, kind of black and white areas of where a cloth face covering is the default, but then there are situations that are pointed out, particularly in um, truck driving, for example, where a shift between a cloth face covering and a mask uh, has a substantive change as to what you're allowed to do within that cab. And so we'll get to that in a moment. Uh, a reminder again about your employees' rights. Uh, 
associated with what um, they can and cannot be required to do. And so there's references there about um, if they meet certain requirements, they certainly have a right to refuse to do uh, unsafe work. Uh, the next thing that you'll see is that the, your plan, so your mitigation plan, uh, stays relatively the same at first. We still require COVID-19 supervisors on each site or a designee. Uh, we've had lots of conversations about that since this started. Uh, the safety training aspects are um, virtually the same. Uh, that, that has to be conducted at the first time that something's brought together and then on a weekly basis following suit. Um, again, that's just to make sure that if something's changed in the environment, or some new protocol or, or something's been put in place to respond to a situation that folks are up on that um, and taking that seriously. Uh, and then finally, the, the one that this, the drum roll please moment is that we are finally burst uh, the six foot bubble or we have the ability to do so, right? So the physical distancing requirement is still there. Um, however, it does have the, um, the language that allows for in the situations where certain uh, hands-on instruction requires you to be within that six feet that you are now able to do so with the appropriate um, controls in place. Uh, and there are links out again to the various tools and resources from LNI and DOH to help you make the determinations of what is appropriate. Uh, down under PPE is where you'll see the reference that um, while a student is not classified as a worker, uh, we are still um, required to uh, provide the appropriate PPE um, at no cost to a student. And there've been a lot of questions around that. And so we're, um, from an equity standpoint and access standpoint, we need to make sure that we at least have um, the appropriate, um, we're not placing a burden on someone, putting yet another barrier on their ability to participate in a program that they're enrolled in. And again, uh, the requirement's still there that uh, if the appropriate, uh, mitigation controls and PPE cannot be provided for particular activities and that program cannot um, proceed. Uh, your sanitation and cleanliness stays relatively the same as previously. Um, I do want to point out in number 17, um, there is a distinction there about um, sanitization between users and there is a requirement. And so there was a bit of back and forth on this. So I want to just draw our eyes to the word wipe. So wipe sanitized. Um, and that is an assertion from Department of Health that we do, you can't just spray it and be done. There has to be a, a cleansing action that's occurring right in that. So tools and those kinds of things do have to be wiped down um, as a part of that um, sanitization process. Uh, underneath uh, employee health symptoms, uh, items 21 and 22. So lots of questions in the initial rollout around thermometers and temperature taking and, and the like, right? So uh, specifically number two, 22, uh, clarifies that um, you have two options there. There's an or statement. You can ask your employees and students uh, to um, attest to their home temperature taking prior to coming to campus uh, or participating in an activity, um, or they would need to do that upon arrival. And so that provides that clarification there. Uh, so in that situation, uh, going forward, I know there has been lots of conversation around um, corrections and Department of Corrections um, students and temperature taking. So what this provides for is that self-attestation. And since someone is a, essentially under the care of the state, that facility would be able to assert that that individual is um, of health, right? So they, they are well in order to participate. That facility would then need to um, be able to attest as to whether or not those individuals are being following the standard protocols that are already in place at DOC to um, determine a um, uh, individual's health status, okay? So I hope that provides some clarity for us there. Uh, number Nate, 25, wanna just make sure that- Nate, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, there's a question in the chat. Is this at the building level or the classroom level for temp and attestation? Hmm. Is that, uh, I'm trying to make sure I understand that correctly. So. Related to maybe correct. Basically. Or. On the correction side. Mm -hmm. So uh, that, that requirement on corrections is that essentially it is on corrections that they would not allow someone to go to class um, if they were not well. Is that fair? Yes. And now there has been clarification. So before that, your comment before corrections. 
um, on the campus mm -hmm. level? Is this at the building level or the classroom level for temp and attestation? Uh, hmm. I guess I'm trying to understand the nuance there. So for me, I think it's, um, uh, uh, and so whether or not you're trying to capture that attestation, uh, are you trying to document that attestation? Is that what you're saying, Christina? I'm going to have to speak, aren't I? Um, <laughs> Sorry. I'm trying, Christina. That's all right. um, no, it's, it's, uh, I'm just thinking of logistics for if somebody is coming into a building, it's fine if there's one way into a building, but if your campus has multiple buildings, is it then up to the instructor or how would that information be collected gotcha. would it be at the door of the classroom or would you funnel people to only one entrance and one exit? So I do think that what you get to do there is that does get to become a local decision as to how your mitigation plan would say that. Um, so you would have to decide is that something that are you, are you doing a single uh, campus point of entry or whether or not you're doing a individual classroom point of entry. Um, there's obviously some pros and cons to each one of those, but that is something that you'd have to figure out um, at your training locations. Um, and again, there are nuances to your plan. So your plan may be written to that uh, building level or to that campus level, but if you're operating in off-site locations, as for example, many of our apprenticeship programs do, uh, you would have to have a nuance to that situation as well. So uh, I think it, it sadly is one of those answers where I get to be the bureaucrat that says it depends. <laughs> I hope that answers the question though. Yeah. Right, and we yeah, do so have some folks the chiming in. Uh, one would have to follow Perfect. their COVID-19 plan and how the traffic control is laid out. It is a local decision, et cetera. So thank you. Perfect. All right, um, draw your attention to number 25 in the document. So um, just a reminder here that as a part of this, um, if an individual has been out of state um, in a basically anywhere other than Idaho or Oregon, because those are presently the only two states that border us, um, then um, the, uh, they would have to self-quarantine for 14 days, and that is uh, still a requirement that's still in place. So just wanna make sure that you're aware of that. Um, and as of right now, I think the borders are still closed, so I don't think we have to stress too much about the, the VC side. Uh, and again, the location visitor logs is still a part of the protocols that you have before you. And again, the request for that is that those are being maintained for a period of at least four weeks. Um, I know there's been lots of questions around record retentions of that. And so our colleges may actually, there has been a question that was posed to our AAG about those. And so I think our record retention may actually require that to be a little bit longer than the four weeks. So we should be actually operating pretty well on that. But keep in mind that these guidelines are not just for our colleges who are subject to those, but are also um, being utilized by private career schools under the guide of the uh, Workforce Training Board, as well as the Department of Licensing. Um, hey, so as usual, well. whatever's the most restrictive. Yep. Oh, sorry about that, to interrupt you. Another question um, regarding number 25, is self-attestation sufficient for number 25? Um, Yes, I wouldn't think that you would have to have it, something beyond that, right? And I, and again, it puts you in a, a in your plan. Again, it, that would be a local determination of how you would implement that control. But um, I think much beyond that puts you in a pretty um, obtrusive uh, request as to how would you get beyond a self attestation. So that that should work. Okay, thank you. Uh, so there are then below um, the the twenty seven bullets. Um, some special uh, provisions that are out there for a handful of programs. And the first is cosmetology, uh, just a reference back that um, you still have to follow all of the other standard safety and sanitation standards that are outlined in the administrative code. So there's just a link over to provide that resource for you. And then there are two call outs relative to motorcycle training and the uh, handling of the equipment if you were providing your own bikes for that. And then finally, um, Gen general language around training and testing that's taking place inside of a vehicle. So uh, many of you know about the ride along requirements associated with um, CDL, but also for things like your EMT training programs as well, where you have ride alongs that are occurring. Um, so one thing that I wanna point out in there for you is the fourth bullet down about uh, that when you're using a cloth face covering, you're limited to one student in the cab. Uh, so essentially no more than two folks, the instructor and the student. 
if you utilize uh, mask techniques, again, based on those that are called out within the LNI guidance documents from DOSH, uh, those masks would enable you to have two students in those cabs per instructor. Obviously, that would cap you at three people, right? And so, um, just want to draw attention uh, to that. Nate, there's a couple questions. Um, let me pull them up real quick. Mm -hmm. um, there's a question from Lisa. Can you elaborate a little bit more about page two and the use of disposable gloves? And then we also have a question regarding flight simulators. Sure. Um, so I'm going to take the easy one first. So the flight simulators, <laughs> you can basically assume that that is the equivalent of a vehicle, right? So I think in that situation, you're going to be um, cloth face covering with um, one student and uh, mask, you could have two. That makes sense. Um, and I'm trying to find where you are saying about the gloves. Let's see if I can pull the question up. Page one. Uh, page two, uh, a little bit more about page two and the use of disposable gloves. Got it. Trying to see if I can catch up. And I can just flag that if we want to get back to folks too, we can send it out an answer. Okay. That's that's better. Yeah. Okay. Um, there was a welding simulator question. What about welding simulators? Yeah. Um, so again, if it's a I'm trying to be careful about how we're um, getting down that rabbit hole just a little bit. So if it is training that's taking place in a vehicle or an enclosed space like a vehicle. So if you're replicating a cockpit environment or you're replicating a truck environment, that's one thing. Um, if you are going to be within that six foot bubble outside of that. So again, part of the, 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 just the framework for thinking about that is that you've got a controlled um, or contained airspace, right? And so you're trying to limit the amount of exposure there um, as much as possible. And so uh, that that would fall into that um, concept. So the welding simulators, to me, would just depend on kind of the, the type of simulator that you're mm -hmm. working with and, and the enclosed nature of the space. Okay. So there is another question about, do you want to get into the specific questions at the end? Do you want to run through the rest and then we can go back through the chat and talk about the specifics? Sure. Um, okay take a look here for you. I think we were basically there at the end already. Um, so that was the, the only thing that I was going to call out specifically within um, the additional and specific provision. You'll notice that on the phase one cosmetology is uh, struck from that because that is not considered a phase one uh, program. Okay. Uh, and then the last thing is just that there's the last page has a series of um, resources that are available there for you. The DOSH team at LNI uh, has put there um, how to contact them if you have specific questions that, or if you need some assistance in thinking through a specific scenario. Uh, their team's been wonderful for uh, working with us on some of those um, very specific situations to come up with mitigation uh, strategies there. So their information and links out to their contact information are provided for you. Um, so yeah, we can take a look back at some of the more specific questions. And so maybe before we do that, we just talk about next steps. I think, you know, as this goes in, we'll continue to work with the governor's office and Department of Health and our other agency partners to look at um, as we move towards phase three and knowing the timeline with our summer schools mainly are going to be starting those quarters in the next couple of weeks. So knowing that we still have some classes out there that are needing to, uh, to get operationalized. And so um, Nate and I will be working on uh, with those partners to kind of figure out where the next steps are with that. Mm -hmm. So Nate, you've got a couple questions. I'm pulling uh, them up. Um, when we say those activities are specific activities, does that mean entire lab or location or person-to-person -person contact as a part of a lab? This is on page one, bullet two. Okay. So basically, if I can make sure I'm understanding this correctly, uh, I think you can definitely still have under a phase two situation, you can now have that um, 
that direct person-to-person -person contact with appropriate PPE, right? And so obviously in those programs where you're gonna have a much higher risk, it may be kind of a, a multi-layered approach even, right? So if you're in a situation, um, and obviously the one that comes to mind are, are things in, in dental in those spaces, you're much more likely to need kind of that layered approach of a full mask, a face shield, th those kinds of things to prevent aerosols from occurring or from coming into contact with the individual. Um, if you're going to be a part in a, in a science lab in that scenario of um, something like that, that's going to be a, you already have some level of distance. And so both of those activities are allowable um, if they're a part of this, um, you know, your programming. But the, the, the nuance here is really about um, what are the controls that you're using to, to protect those individuals. So there's a question for CDL programs. Um, is clarification available on which type of mask is appropriate, surgical or N95? Yeah, that's a great question. So again, I would say that there are links within the document um, in the PDF version that um, We'll link you over to the resources from LNI, and those are intentionally linked because as those documents get updated, um, you'll have a link to directly whatever the latest version of that thinking through is. Um, and the last thing that I'll say is that I would encourage you to um, regularly check back to see if there have been any updates or revisions to that. Um, these things are obviously very much alive and living documents, and so. Um, there is a there is a need for checking back to see if any of them have been updated with um, revise your guidance based on situations or scenarios that have been presented to L and I. Okay, there's a question about um, science labs uh, and those courses that are maybe outside of um, workforce that are non lecture based. So I'm thinking art studios, performing arts, etc. And so there's a clarification on those labs that would support workforce program pathways, and that would be included and allowable in, in this phase two with the appropriate safety protocols adhered to. But if I'm understanding it correctly, it's the art classes, um, the, lab, the studios, the ceramics labs, et cetera, that are not allowed at this time. Correct. Um, it, it would need to be um, uh, a laboratory environment that's in uh, that's a part of a, a workforce training pathway um, at this point in, in the initial versions of phase two. Correct. Uh, so at this point, that would mean something like a prerequisite lab for um, a healthcare pathway, right? So if mm -hmm. you're looking at um, uh, I know one of the ones that came up frequently were um, courses in um, for example, um, the science requirements for going into those, the, the biological sciences that are a requirement as a part of those pathways. So those will be allowable at this point. Um, the, uh, you know, if it was exactly the scenarios that uh, Carly was giving out, the art studios and those things at this point, um, performance art, those side, at this point, they would not be uh, included in the phase two. So another question, um, I think we might have answered this, Non-lecture based higher ed, could that include things like non-credit lab classes? Yes, so this can be both credit, non-credit. It's not um, distinguishing in that way. So if you have a workforce uh, aligned program that's a non-credit based program, absolutely. And those are, that also holds true uh, in phase one as well. If there's an aligned program to those um, program types that are that are on the published list and if you've got a specific one that you're, you're uncertain about please feel free to reach out be happy to um, help make uh, that determination with you okay we've got a question about commencement this might be out of our wheelhouse but we can definitely try with commencement coming up are drive-through diploma cover pickups allowed under phase one or phase two and what about testing that needs to be proctored or requirements for some of these courses yeah, so I'm going to punt the commencement question, and we will have to get back to you on that one. Mm -hmm. um, great question, but we'll have to follow back up with you for that. Um, as far as, um, I'm trying to remember what the second part of that one was. Second, no, it's okay, sorry, I, it was a run-on sentence for me. What about <laughs> testing that needs to be proctored or requirements for some of these courses? Yeah, so a couple thoughts on that. So I would say that if there's a, a lab-based component of that, um, 
testing that needs to occur, that certainly that makes sense to me as to being able to operate in, um, so like skills demonstration, that aspect. Uh, anything that can still be proctored online, the state board has stepped up uh, and provided uh, uh, extensive licensing for online proctoring. So if you need help getting connected to that, we'd be more than happy to do so. Um, but anything that can remain online or with technology could remain online should stay there. Uh, but again, skills demonstration as a part of an examination or testing, absolutely, that, that would fall into one of these eligibility areas. Okay, great. Uh, I see a question now, there about nursing. Oh, go ahead. Uh, and I saw a question about nursing, sorry, and so I just wanted to hit that one too. That's absolutely allowable in phase one or phase two um, already. Yep. So colleges are able to move to phase two if their county's in phase two, correct? Correct. It is county by county. And so if you have a location in a phase two county and a location in a phase one county, you get the joy of operating under two different plans. But um, it is correct. It's based on the location of the training uh, and the county status at that point. Okay. So we've got a question about who's providing gloves and masks. We do have a request in from, I believe, John Bozenberg is looking at that. The presidents have made that request. So We'll continue to um, follow up with John to see if we have any clarity there yet this week. Um, you talked about CNA. What about basic education lab activities? So again, if those are um, somehow kind of a, a hands-on lab activity, then um, I could see that, but do stay mindful that anything that can um, be delivered in a um, online remote environment should be. Um, so if it's general instruction, those would not be in a face-to-face -face classroom style, right? These will be hands-on. This would be the, the stuff that you cannot uh, find a way to convert. So question, um, computer-based training in a computer lab, could this be considered workforce training that would be allowed under phase one or phase two? It's a great question. Again, I think it would have to be um, the, the, the pieces there under phase one, it's a matter of whether or not it's a part of one of those approved program types, right? Under phase two, it's gonna be again, um, it falls back to the ability for that instruction is it requires some kind of specialized computing uh, that you cannot find a way to get online. And so I'd rather have that conversation in kind of a specific scenario than talk about it in generalities, if that makes sense. Um, because I think anything that you can possibly get into an online, I know that there are obviously uh, significant barriers to that, um, but we would have to talk through kind of the nuances of that situation. If there's any way to keep it remote, it should be. Okay. So a uh, specific question, uh, are we able to receive some sport, <laughs> I can't talk, some sort of written guidance from LNI that classroom labs are not limited to nine students and one instructor? What to the amount of potential students a classroom lab can safely hold under COVID-19 spacing requirements? Yeah, so um, I, I'm not sure where the, the nine student cap is, is coming from with the LNI, unless it's some of the, the kind of framework uh, guidance that's out there um, in, the, in the Start Safe plan. Um, but uh, these documents are the ones that we are operating under, right? So as far as your instruction goes, this is essentially um, higher education and workforce training programs um, carve out, if you will, from the governor's um, executive orders. In fact, those are referenced in here as that um, so long as that order is in place or any amendment or extension thereof, uh, uh, that this is what you are being allowed to operate under. So this is what you're held to uh, in that standard. Okay. So if you have something like that that's in kind of the overarching, you know, limiting your contact to X number of individuals within a week, those kinds of things, this is in addition to anything that's happening there. So those uh, numbers are not assigned in, in this particular, um, I hate to use the word carve out, but the, this particular window um, that's open for our training programs. So there's a question for a clarification. So workforce is not just a list of programs, but also those prereqs. Correct. Student support, computer labs, question mark, with social distancing and PPE. Uh, student supports at this point are anticipated to be in phase three. So your wholesale reopening of your student supports, um, WISC is still continuing to work through some of the details around that. 
Um, there have been colleges that have um, found ways for appointment based in order to maintain really tight restrictions on that, but wholesale kind of student support, student services buildings being open at this point is not um, something that's a part of phase two. Is CPR approved for the skills demonstration, the lecture online, if it is part of a phlebotomy program? Um, so in going forward in phase one or two, um, yes, if it's a part of one of those, in phase one, if it's a part of one of those programs, in phase two, if it's a part of the prerequisite or program requirements in healthcare or one of those pathways, absolutely. Okay, great. In order to, to show the demonstration of skill that's required for that. Uh, it says for corporate training, fluids and welding that is provided for a business has a few hours of lecture needed to prepare participants for the lab. Does that lecture section fall under the lab or lecture rules? Great nuanced question. Um, I, again, I'm going to fall back to the language there around um, if it's lecture, it needs to stay online. The, uh, if it is something where you are bringing the students together in order to inform them about the, the, what you're about to go and do in that lab space. So I'm envisioning kind of um, uh, my last lab experience, if you will, where you're instructing the students on what you're going to be doing that day and the safe techniques about how that is to occur. That is, to me, a part of that lab, right? So in that scenario, it's, that's there. If it's all out lecture delivery, that module should be online versus what's going to be done um, safely in a lab environment. I hope that answers the question. Okay. What if you live in a county that's still in phase one, but you work at a college that's in phase two? Good question. It's again about um, the location of that training. So if your main campus is in a phase one county, but you operate a satellite location in phase two, that satellite location is able to operate the programs um, at a phase two capacity, if that makes sense. Again, that's a local decision as to how you're going to operate your institution, um, but it, you're, nothing compels you to operate um, underneath either one of these fan, these phases. Okay. For on-site workforce training, if a company is following phase one protocols, including health attestation, what is your recommendation to start training on-site regarding health questionnaires and attestation prior to class? thinking through that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a, it's a really good question. Um, we can capture this chat and we can get back to this yeah. one too. I have, I'm keeping a list. I think, that's a, okay. I, think I wanna think through that one before I uh, pop off on that one. We'll get you some more caffeine. Um, but I think <laughs> generally, right, I do need it. I think generally, if you're if you're working with a partner and you're operating your training within their facility, um, there certainly has been a lot of nuance about whether or not that's a part of your plan or a part of their plan. If you're delivering something like an incumbent worker training program, you are, what I would argue is that what needs to occur there is that um, that's now authorized under your phase two without question, and then within phase one, within, um, the, the list of approved programs. The nuance here would be that if those employees are operating at their employer's site, then they are operating underneath their employer's plan and your employee is operating underneath your plan. So you'll have to work with your um, employer training partner to make sure that those things are aligned as much as possible. But at the end of the day, those are their employees operating underneath their safety protocols. Uh, and it's your responsibility to make sure that your employee is protected at that point, if that makes sense. So there is a question about athletic teams and being able to practice in small groups. I don't think we are even close to being there yet. So we're, that's not in phase two. It's most likely not going to no. be resumed until phase four if, uh, and when we get there. So um, right. worker retraining, we have that question. Can we offer prerequisites without having an approved program? I'm not sure I understand mm -hmm. that question. Carrie, you can harass me um, on okay. email. Okay. Or you can do it right now. <laughs> I can ask real quick. So, can we offer our general, like, bio labs that support um, pre nursing without having an approved program? I think we would have a hard time with that 
in in the phase two. Um, we can we can certainly follow up with you on that, but I think right now I would err on the side of caution. If you don't have the program that you are supplying those students to, it would be difficult to do so, um, and that would be true for any program um, on your campus and any course. So if you don't have the program to show that that's a prerequisite to it, I think that's a difficult, um, difficult justification, at least at this point. And we can certainly continue to seek that clarification for you. Um, but it, it would be very difficult to, to justify that at that point. That at that point, um, that feels like we're we're getting treated differently than others, and I would have difficulty with that. Thank okay. you for that. Appreciate it. Sorry, I didn't interrupt you, Carrie. So I know we need to get going, Nate. We have to transition. Um, we have one last question that says, what about A&P? And A&P would be allowed in phase two. So um, there is a request for a final version of phase two document. I think that went out. So let us, um, we'll resend that because um, I'm not sure if all our yeah. friends on 187 of you got the same one. So we'll make sure that goes out and we'll talk. Um, and if you have any chat, if you have any questions, well, thanks, Nate, for being on it. Um, if you have any questions after this call, you know, we have our information um, here on the the screen. If you need to hold, get a hold of us, please do. Our cell phones, I believe, are published as well. So if you can find those, you're welcome to harass us at any time. So um, we look forward to chatting with you. Thank you for jumping on in such short and quick notice. And um, if there's anything we can do to improve our communication with all of you, please let us know. So again, thank you for joining us, Nate. Thanks for uh, always getting into the weeds. It's very much appreciated. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, guys.